completely unable to get a solo contract of his own, which is why he was a little bit blown away when he was offered one immediately on the very first night of his very first show in London. Jimmy was very different than everybody else, and record executives were already struggling to keep up with how fast music and culture were changing in 1966. The reliable pop bangers of the British invasion were fizzling out, being replaced by songs like Norwegian Wood and Painted Black. Well-crafted, intentional compositions by musicians who were now asking to be seen as artists instead of just hit makers. Jimi Hendrix was a black guitar player, but he wasn't like Chuck Berry. He wasn't like B.B. King or Muddy Waters, and he didn't reminisce of Robert Johnson or Lead Belly. There was no one else to compare him to. Why go back into the past, you know? Why go back there and drag out blue suede shoes? They're not offering you anything this very instant, are they? There's so many musicians right now playing 20 times better than any Chuck Berry or any uh, Beth Stone or any, but I'm not putting these people down. I'm just saying that the music's better now and people just don't even know it. it's right in their faces. They don't even know how to accept it because it's, you know, this is so much better. And perhaps it was this singularity and his inability to feel like he belonged in any one place at any given time that made his songwriting so strikingly different too. I'm going to wait on myself. Way down where I can be free. A lot had changed for James Hendrix, who was now going by Jimmy. By mid-October, he was now settling in with his new band members, bassist Noel Redding and drummer Mitch Mitchell, and he was signed to his first ever record contract with Track Records. Just five months earlier in May, he was playing the Greenwich Village club scene under the name Jimmy James, when Linda Keith, the famous model and girlfriend at the time of Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, walked in and caught the show. It was then Linda who introduced Jimmy to her friend Chas Chandler, the bassist for the the animals who was leading the band with the intention of becoming more of a producer manager. When Chaz met Jimmy, he said that they should go to London immediately, where the music scene was much more happening and he had a much better chance of being appreciated by the people there. Now, here he was in London less than six months later working on his first record. One of the reasons that Chaz decided to go after managing Hendrix was because when he saw him live the first time in the village, he was doing a cover of a song that Chaz loved called Hey Joe and it had been a mission of his recently to find an artist to cover it. The story of how Hey Joe got to Jimmy is a whole other thing. The premise of the song isn't too complicated. It's a timeless tale of a jealous husband who's leaving the country as a result of shooting his wife after finding her cheating on him. It's dark and it's a bit twisted. In the way, it almost implies that the man should be excused for committing such a crime, given the circumstances. The authorship of the song has been challenged. Officially, it's credited to American folk musician Billy Roberts, who started playing the song in the late 1950s and claimed to have written it spontaneously while on stage at one of the many clubs that he'd been performing at at the time. Hey Joe, heard you shot your woman dead. Yes, I did. I got both of them lying in that bed. But it's also possible that it was at least partially written by Billy's friend, another folk singer called Dino Valenti. Another claim to the base of the song is Neela Miller, Billy Roberts' girlfriend at the time, who had written a song called Baby Don't Go to Town. I'm gonna sit in a bar with my feet tucked in, drinking all the beer and whiskey and gin, and I'm looking at the young man. Whoever it was that initially wrote the song, Billy is the one who copyrighted it in 1962 when it started to become popular. Pete Seeger even got involved. He was backing up Neela, saying, Hey Joe is basically just a ripoff of Neela's song, that he would be behind her if she chose to take Roberts to court. Additionally, there was an American folk classic called Little Sadie that was first recorded way back in 1929 by a singer named Clarence Ashley, which had very similar lyrics to Hey Joe. Went out last night to take a little Around, I met a little Sandy and I blowed her down. I run around the hall while I went to bed. 44 smoke loose on my head. 
and was likely the first source to feature this kind of lyrical theme and style. So eventually the song was heard by the mid 60s folk rock generation. Dino Valenti moved to California and started playing the song as his own composition out there. He would eventually become the singer of the band the Quicksilver Messenger Service, who were a central part of the West Coast hippie scene and incidentally good friends of Hendrix. And around 1964, a little known folk rock musician named David Crosby stumbled on the song himself and brought it to his band The Birds. At first, Roger McGuinn and the other birds didn't like the song as much as Crosby did, and so that they could sometimes include it in their live set if Crosby did the vocals. At this point, a group of garage rock artists caught wind of the song when they heard the birds playing it live, and they all did covers of it themselves, including, and most significantly, The Leaves. <laughs> recorded and released the song more than once, finally scoring a top 40 hit with it in 1966. Also, the Surfaris, known for their song Wipeout, covered it sometime between 1965 and 1966. Hey, Joe, Next, the band Love covered it, also having learned it from Crosby, who taught it to Brian McLean, co-founder of Love, when McLean was working as a roadie for the Birds, and they included it on their 1966 album release. It was likely Love's version of the song that was first introduced to Jimi Hendrix, who added it to his repertoire and started playing it around the clubs in Greenwich Village. Around the same time, on the other side of the country, Crosby started to get pissed that all these other artists were having success with the song he discovered. He was therefore finally able to convince the other birds, and they included a version of it on their 1966 album, Fifth Dimension. I hear you shot your woman But afterwards, the reception of Crosby's version of the song, not great. The main criticism being that Crosby simply did not have the depth in his voice to carry the intense, dark subject matter occurring in Hey Joe. I don't think it's that terrible, but I'm a sucker for Crosby. Anyways, around the same time, a folk singer named Tim Rose covered the song, slowing it down a little bit. He said he learned it from the folk singer Vince Martin, and the two of them insisted this must for sure be a traditional. The song was barely a decade old at this point, but it was pre-internet days, nobody had any idea who the original author was. And it was Tim Rose's version that Chas Chandler heard playing in a club one night, setting him off on a journey to find someone who could adequately cover Hey Joe the way that it should be recorded. Hey Joe would be the first song that the Jimi Hendrix experience would record together, and it would also be their first release pre preceding the release of their full-length album, Are You Experienced? They would set Jimmy's version of the track out in the UK in December 1966, where it became a fast hit, climbing up the charts to number six, alongside heavy hitters like The Supremes, Donovan, Small Faces, and The Kinks. However, it was barely noticed at the time by American audiences. To say that Hey Joe is the first song of the psychedelic rock era might be accurate. The Beatles had already done things like Tomorrow Never Knows. They were in the process of working on the music for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band when they heard Jimmy's version of the song. Eric Clapton's ears nearly melted off when he heard Hey Joe. This was a new wave. Darker, more serious music was taking the place of the light, poppy, fun stuff of the early 60s. And the musicians were more serious too. Less than three years later, Jimi Hendrix would play the song as an encore to his performance at the Woodstock Festival in August 1969, making it the very last song played by the very last artist at the event. And for the next 50 years, music media would call it one of the best Jimi Hendrix songs, one of the greatest cover versions of any song ever, and one of the most iconic recordings that helped kick off off the psychedelic era in popular music. Hey Joe started it all. Mm -hmm. 